Hey everyone, this is Cabs here. Um, went out and see saw Doom, Doom Two. Uh, had a really really great time. Saw it in IMAX. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna give my thoughts about it. Uh, but I just want to say, um, I really love this film. Um, I think it's, I don't think it's necessarily better than the first one. I think there's elements that are better than the first one, and I'll talk about those elements. Um divided between good, bad, and some of the parts I really, really love. Um, before I go into it, uh, I want to say thank you for all the new subscribers that I gained. I really appreciate it. Um, it really means a lot to me. Um, if you like this video, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Um, leave a comment. Your every, every thought means a lot to me. Um, and I want to thank you guys for, for all those new subscribers. Um, and welcome to my channel. Anyway, um, so this is going to be a spoiler free review. I'm not going to give too much away, maybe a little bit of breadcrumbs, but for the most part, um, I'm just going to paint a very broad strokes about the film. All right. Uh, Paul is back for revenge. So if you saw the first one, which was basically an intro movie, give you kind of like some flesh about who these characters are, the Atreides, House of Atreides, the Harkonnens, the Fremen, um, where their allegiance lies. Um, you kind of have an idea of where this film is going, and it's strictly somewhat of a revenge plot movie. Um, there are some parts in this movie that are, I guess, tonally different than the first film, and there are comedic moments, um, but they, they, they give way to what Paul needs to do. And in this movie, he's grappling the fact that I want to become a fi Fremen fighter, I'll fight alongside the Fremen. Um, I do want to avenge my father, but I want to know the Fremen ways. Um, I love Chani. I want to be with her, whatever she needs me to do. Um, but I'm also rep uh, grappling the weight and the impending doom of my true destiny in which my mother um, is now deciding to take him part. Um, so Paul is kind of winning not only the hearts and minds of the people, but he's more of trying to be embedded within the culture. He, even though he's looked at as a foreigner, he is a Fremen fighter. Um, he gains their ways while his mother who's pregnant with Paul's sister, um, is working on the religious element. Um, not only when we gain the, the minds of these people, but we also want to ensure that they stand with you and for the cause. And she's working on that battle um, for Paul. Um, but alongside, it seems to be like it's more for her. And I don't, I don't think it's much of a spoiler. If you read the book, um, the movie stays somewhat towards, faithful towards the book, but not necessarily. Um, it kind of deviates in some parts. And I'm not going to give a lot of that away. Just suffice it to say, that it does take a few detours, but it gets the same result, so to speak. Um, like I said, this is a more action-packed movie. Um, Paul's is weighing his destiny. You know, he's looked at as by the people of Fremen and the Bene Gesserit who are trying to stop him from becoming the Lisan Al Gaib, which is the voice from the outer world. Um, I want to get into like the good parts of the film and then work on towards the bad parts and then. Uh, I'll talk about fade. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, let's talk about like the movie. Please see this in IMAX. Um, I, I tend to not really like IMAX because the seats are so close together and so tight. We saw it in Fayetteville, which is a beautiful theater, beautiful theater, beautiful seats. Um, and when we sat down, we knew we were in for a treat. Um, you can hear every explosion within that film, uh, all the artillery fire, the music when it pumps out. You can feel it within your seats. It literally shakes you from your seat. Um, like they, the sandworm section when Paul was riding sandworm. I mean, you've seen it in the trailer, so I'm not really spoiling anything. Um, when he's riding the sandworms, um, you literally feel like I felt like I was with Paul <laughs> during that scene. Um, you could feel the rumble and the roar and the sand particles and, and debris kind of kick up. Um, it's really, truly a sight to behold in IMAX. And a lot of times when Paul 
or Lady Jessica using the voice, you can feel um that boom, that 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 timber within their voice to kind of like pull you in, and it's really great. So I recommend anyone if you're going to see Dune to um the director Denis Villeneuve uh, and crew work really hard. Um, you owe it to yourself to see it at least once in IMAX. That being said, um the pacing of this movie is definitely better than the first film. Um, since this action movie has to move at a steady clip, this movie comes in around 165 minutes. So this is shy of th three hours. So, um, and the action is great. Like the knife scenes alone in this movie are really, really, really awesome. Um, they're getting in real close. Um, they're very dynamic. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the fade part, but, uh, uh, when he jumps on scene, um, you know exactly he means business. Um, and some of those scenes with him and Paul are some of the best scenes in the movie. Um, now I kind of want to talk on the bad parts of the film. And they're not really bad parts. They're just nitpicks or whatever. Since this movie, you can tell like this movie would have been longer, could have and should have been longer. Um, there are some characters on the scene um, Leia Sadu's character, um, uh, which, uh, Stellan Skarsgård, um, there are some characters on the scene that you wish you had more time with, and you felt that kind of their, their lines or their direction of the film kind of got cut a little bit. Um, I'm just assuming, um, I'm, I haven't checked, but it just felt like certain parts were like a little bit rushed, um, not so noticeably, um, but yeah, the pacing is definitely better than the first film um where you're kind of like inter being introduced to these characters you're kind of there we're including some of the lore so you're kind of like going a nice nice slow burn this film is as, as soon as you jump in um as soon as the film starts um paul and his mother they're on the run uh, with the fremen um and they're dodging the harkonnen and literally as soon like within the first i would soon 10 to 15 minutes action starts like literally just really jumps into the action and from there on we're into different parts of the film where showing a little bit of action a little bit of dialogue a little bit of comedic moments which i'll talk about later okay um it's the tone of the film um i wouldn't say this is bad like i said it's more nitpicky um but since it's a revenge film you know paul is back for blood um you you have an idea that it is going to be a lot darker in tone, you would assume. Um, but there are some elements in the film where they come off very comedic. And what I mean by that is it's not really sp spoiling too much. You kind of see a little bit in the trailer, but uh, Stilgar, played by Har Javier Bardem, um, his character, he's more of, he is the leader of the Fremen. And over the course of the first film, you you don't really see that much of him until like towards the end, just like Chani. Um, but for most of this film, he is starting to see signs of Paul becoming um, more like the Lisan al -Gaib. He, he He's displaying signs of the Messiah. And gradually over the course of that, he's enveloped in the fact that, yes, he is. He is the one. He He's more that Morpheus character. But some of the lines that come off from uh Javier um come off as comedic and I wasn't sure if they were supposed to. Um the audience when we were in the theater, the audience was laughing at certain parts. And I think that's really like it, it's it, it's great that you know everyone's gonna have a different interpretation of some of how the dialogue comes across and some of the delivery. But I wasn't entirely sure whether some of those lines were comedic or some of the lines were like in, in Javier and Stilgar's fanaticism. Um, he, he's, he's coming to grips with like, yes, I, I everything I thought of what thought he was, is true. And he's fully believing in it. And even the wide eyes and, you know, almost talking to himself and, you know, Paul saying, I'm not this. And it, I don't want to give too much away, but um, yeah, some of the moments were kind of like, like that. Um, not bad. I shouldn't have said bad, but it's a little bit more nitpicky. Um, okay. So you saw in the thumbnail, um, fade. Um, I had no idea about Austin Butler. Um, I heard a lot of things, a lot of great things about him and Elvis. I still haven't seen that movie. Um, 
but some of the things that I have seen and some of the things I have heard, like he's a terrific actor, um, very versatile, very dynamic. As Fade, I feel, and this is a very strong feeling, I feel that if he was not cast as Fade, I don't think this movie would have been successful as it was. And what I mean by that, and there were some talks, the past, uh, fa- the past Fade that was played by Sting also was a scene stealer. And literally, um, he joins a long list of actors who have stolen stolen the attention of the movie away from the original star. To me, I'm only speaking for to me, to me, um, he's joined the likes of, you know, Heath Ledger stealing The Dark Knight from Christian Bale, uh, Michael B. Jordan stealing Black Panther away from Chadwick Boseman, and um, Angelina Jolie stealing um, her character, her scenes from Winona Ryder and Girl Interrupted. Austin Butler pretty much stole a lot of the key scenes away from Timothy Chalamet. Um, Timothy Chalamet is, is an extraordinary actor. There's, I'm not discounting him in any way or any of the actors and actresses that were in this movie. They all did a wonderful job. I'm talking about when Fade enters the scene and the way they portray Fade, his ruthlessness, um, the horror in him, the beauty of him. Um, it, it's, it, it, it has you locked in. Um, like he does things with knives and stuff like that you, you've never even seen. And the way that um, the crew shot this film um, is remarkable. Um, when Gunny in the original film approaches Paul and talks to him about the brutality of the Harkonnens, I think he was talking about Fade. This is, this is who he was talking about. Um, he does not care about life he does not care about other people's pain it's it's all just a game to him it's all everyone is just toys for him to be butchered and slaughtered and in the scenes where he is combating the other people in the arena um beautifully shot scene um within the black sun of getty prime um i i've never seen anything like it uh, Greg Frazier, cinematographer for Dune, he's an original Dune, uh, the first Dune, along with Denny Villeneuve, they really hit it out the park with this one in terms of the cine- cinematography. Um, a lot of the shots are just, they like literally that scene still stays with me. Um, there are more scenes that stay with me, but I don't want to get into spoilers with that. But I, I, was, a, I, was, I was in awe of, of Austin Butler's portrayal of Fade, and I really wish they had more scenes with him of him in the film and i can understand why certain actors and actresses had certain scenes or maybe there were certain scenes that were cut i'm just assuming um but it just felt like certain things were somewhat rushed um towards the towards the back half of the film a middle to the middle to the back half of the film so yeah um yeah i i i, I there's not enough i can and say if you imagine if you can imagine to describe Fade, to, to put him into words, if you can imagine Homelander uh, with knives and bald, he's a bald, knife-wielding Homelander, that would describe Fade. That, the anticipation, like, as soon as he enters screen, you don't know what he's going to do. I really like that. Um, similar to Homelander, I don't know what he's going to do. And I felt he added a different dimension to the film, um, a different tonal shift um, to the film. Like, I knew that, like, the Baron was horrifying, but Faye was just as just if not more so horrifying. And what's really great about Austin Butler is like during the movie while I was listening to him speak, he sounded like Stellan Skarsgård. Like there were times where he was speaking, I thought Stellan Skarsgård was on screen, but it was like, no, 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 that's that's Austin Butler. And that was remarkable. Like a lot of the things that he did in this movie, he improvised, he put into into action. And that's like the hallmark of a, of a great performer. Um and like I feel that he has a very bright future in industry. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a chance. I'll watch Elvis to get the full, full brunt of it. But uh, yeah, um, he did an amazing job. And like I said before, I don't think this movie would have been half as successful, half as successful if he wasn't in the film. Um, yeah. So pretty much in a nutshell, without giving too much away, if you like action, if you like beautiful cinematography, great actors and actresses on screen just 
having fun, um, revenge plot. You know, if you like those things, I would. And if you like hearing wonderfully crisp, beautiful, booming sound, I recommend going out seeing Dune to an IMAX or if you if not IMAX, it, it, whatever format that is best for you. It's really a great movie. We need more movies like this. Um, and if not like this, we need more passionate, creative um, artists who are given creative license and creative freedom to make those type of movies. I know this is an adaptation of Frank Herbert's book. Um, and I know it's not one to one, um, but from what I've seen, I love Dune One. I was literally, I literally went out, saw Dune in the theater. No, literally when it came out, I saw it in on HBO Go when it was HBO Go back then. Um, I saw it multiple times there. I went to theater, saw it in IMAX, saw it in traditional format. <laughs> I consistently always go back to Dune One. Um, it's just one of those movies. It's almost like like Inception. Like I, it. it Every time I find something new within it, and I hope Dune 2 has that same staying power where I'm able to kind of go back and watch and find something new, find something, you know, that I never experienced in my first or second feelings. But yeah, um, I give this film nine Duncan Idaho's out of 10. Like I said, go see it. Um, that's it. That's my review of Dune 2. If you like it, like I said, feel free to like, share, subscribe, um, leave a comment. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for everyone for your support, and I'll see you later. Cabbage out.